Welcome everybody to our today's, today's conference. Uh, my name's Eric Meyer. I'm a research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. I'm the director of the two projects that we're going to be discussing today. Um, we hope we've got an interesting uh, day laid out for you. We've got two portions of the day that are talking about um, these two just funded projects that we've done. One about um, looking at the impact of digitized resources and the other one that is involved in the transatlantic digitization program uh, with our partners Hansa Web and Internet Archives. And we've also got in, in amongst those then two panels that I think will be very interesting discussions with some, uh, we've, we've invited a very good set of panelists to talk about some issues related to digitization and, and archiving in the web and understanding these sorts of materials that are available on the web. So the day is going to start out with the first project in the morning uh, called the Toolkit for the Impact of Digitized Scholarly Resources. And uh, it, it's on a web page here, and I'll be going through this at the end of the hour and a quarter, or at the end of the hour or so that we're presenting this to show you some of the things that are available already in the toolkit and talking about how we hope this toolkit continues to grow over time as people can add new content and content continues to be modified. Um, before that, let me just give you a very brief background, and, and Catherine Eccles is going to give you a much more detailed background of the uh, impact project. It, dates back to last summer sometime when we got the, the grant from JISC to look at uh, ways of understanding the impacts of phase one digitization projects that JISC had funded. Um, and there were five projects that, that Catherine will be describing for you. Um, and when we put in for, the, uh, for the, our proposal, we wanted to not just look at those five projects and just look at their impact. We were interested in also taking a broader look at how can one in general measure impacts of these scholarly resources that are on the web, and can we put together this toolkit to help other people start to measure their impacts? Because this is an issue that I think is um, relevant to uh, not only to funders who are interested in whether their money is being well spent, but also interest, of interest to those people who are putting these resources on the web. Well, how do I know if anybody's using these? And um, we did find out in a number of our interviews that we'll talk about later that a lot of people who are even involved in these projects say, well, we put these together, but we don't really know how people use these or not. So hopefully this will let not only these projects, but other new projects coming up start to think from the very beginning how to start measuring these sorts of impacts that they might be having on various audiences. So let me turn it uh, immediately over to Catherine to start talking about what was in the, what was in the, what the projects were we looked at and a little bit about the origins of the toolkit. Catherine? Thank you. Uh, his book, The Online Historical Population Reports, um, provide, um, provided online access to approximately 200,000 pages of complete British population reports for Britain and Ireland from 1801 to 1937. Um, it included published population reports created by registrars general, um, all census reports for the period 1801 to 1937. It also included some ancillary material that was drawn from the National Archives. In particular, it added um, a set of critical essays that were written specifically for the project by historians Dr. Matthew Woolard and Dr. Edward Higgs from the University of Essex. So users can browse the content um, at the top. Um, you can browse either by date or by geography. You can search more specifically. And when viewing a page, users can either zoom in and out, they can rotate the page, and from the page views, you can navigate either to the next hit or to the next page in the collection. And you can also go to those relevant critical essays by hitting associated content. So here's some of what you'll see when you upload one of the documents from the collection. So on the left-hand side, you can see that there is zoom controls, the rotation controls, and here's a blow-up of one of these um, census reports from 1861, which shows the um, members of the population who were in public institutions at that time, um, so prisons, lunatic asylums, etc. Um, and there's bad news for educators here. The report shows that professional and educated classes furnished a very large number of uh, patients in the lunatic asylums, and in particular schoolmasters and others involved in tuition. So there you go. There's no hope for us. Um, the HISPOP digitization project has made considerable impact on the fields of local history and population studies, and we'll be talking much more in detail about the kinds of impacts further on in the talk. Um, but our, our project has shown that this project's impact continues to grow and is often used in uh, undergraduate and continuing education courses. Um, uh, so Dr. David Green, a lecturer in the Department of Geography at King's College London, said that he's 
used HISPOP in his undergraduate courses, and it gave students more freedom to investigate primary documents, which as undergraduates they wouldn't normally see. Cool. Okay. Moving on, this is our second project, uh, the British Library 19th Century Newspapers <coughs> Digitization Project. Um, now, this project is, um, uh, along with the next British Library project that we're going to be seeing, um, they were both in receipt of JISC 1 and JISC 2 digitisation money. So I'm going to be focusing on the, the phase one part of the project. These are growing all of the time. Um, so the 19th century newspaper uh, um, phase one project digitised over a million pages of content. Um, it provides free access to the communities of higher education and further education to a virtual library of nationally re re national, regional and local uh, newspapers from 1800 to 1900. Um, it, um, one of the great things that it does is allows you to search across newspaper titles and to draw together materials, um, um, providing a, a really wide range of research and learning topics. The digital material is, is um, like I say, free to UK higher education and further education, but is also free of charge in the British Library. So this is the project page at the British Library. Researchers using the British Library web pages from within the library can link straight through to the resource from this page. But researchers outside the library, this, this page purely gives them information about the kind of content that's there. So here is the uh, front page at, um, at Gale Sengage, um, the commercial partners for this project. Um, I mean, Gail has produced some wonderful um, resources here. Um, you can remember your searches, you can mark your items, you can email them to yourself. Um, you can, you can, it's an extremely um, detailed in the amount of information you can save about the kind of searches that you're doing. Um, and when we discussed this resource with our focus groups, researchers commented on how, how useful they found the sidebar, which I've highlighted on the left here and then blown up on the right. Um, here I was searching for Jack the Ripper. Um, so being able to click through to these different categories of news article has been extremely helpful to help you hone in on the kinds of results that you want to look at. And here's another page about the Jack the Ripper, the East End theme. Um, it's great fun going through the, um, the illustrated newspapers here. Highly recommend it. So the impact of this project on the research community has also been considerable and it, of course it's growing all of the time because the resource is now in its second phase and all the new material is being put up on the web as, at the moment. And we found a number of research projects that have been wholly made possible by the fact that you can search across these titles, so new kinds of quantitative research being, uh, being done all the time using this resource. Um, Prof Professor James Seacord at the University of Cambridge said, I've always been suspicious of claims that electronic resources can change your research life, but an exception has to be made for the online archive of British Library 19th century newspapers. So really high praise for this resource as well. This is our third project, the archival sound recordings. Um, again, this is now in um, receipt of just two, um, phase two money. Um, so the, the, the site that you're seeing here has got lots more material and was digitised in phase one. Again, it's growing all of the time. Uh, phase one digitised more than 12,000 items. That's almost 4,000 hours of segmented recordings from its collection of over a million discs, um, hundreds of thousands of tapes and many other sound and video recordings and sound archive. And the material here spans a huge range. There's oral history, there are field and location recordings of traditional and improvised music, rare or deleted classical and popular music, soundscape and um, environmental and um, educational material, wildlife and environmental material, and public debates and performances. So a really vast array of, of research material. The digitised material is free to the, to the higher education and further education communities. And you can play and download this material, so you can really manipulate the sound files when you get them. OK, so here's what you'll see when you download a piece of Mozart. Here is a concerto for violin and orchestra. And you can see one of the things that, um, that's great about this project is the amount of metadata that you can see on the page there. And you can even click for even more of that metadata. And one, um, even though the resource is not um, accessible outside the HE and FE communities at the moment, all of that metadata is. Um, so it's, uh, it's coming up on Google and it's providing researchers who perhaps weren't aware of some of this material with a direct link to, to what's in the sound archive. 
Um, here's a new feature um, on the right-hand side here um, where you can comment on some of the recordings. You can add context. You can, you can help create more information about this resource. So it's really providing a place for researchers to, to even build on what's there already. So among one of the most important aspects of digitizing this material has been raising awareness about the content in the sound archive and making entire collections available to researchers on the web. Um, Celia Duffy, who's the head of research at the National Centre for Research in the Performing Arts um, at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, has said that a collection such as the Braithaven String Quartets, for example, provides access to a wealth of historical recordings, often long unavailable, and on obsolete formats such as 78s. And this creates incredible potential for researchers to assess how performance practice has changed over the years and gain fresh insight into familiar works. Okay, our fourth project. Um, this is the 18th century official parliamentary publications at Bocris. Um, now, this project is available in, in two different places. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, but essentially, the material that was digitised here was drawn from university libraries in Southampton, in Cambridge, in the British Library, and includes journals of the House of Commons and Lords, parliamentary registers, sessional papers of the House of Commons, acts and bills. These original publications were often poorly indexed, and the complex interrelationships between the documents very difficult to understand. So digitisation not only drew this collection together, but allowed researchers to make really pertinent connections. So the digital material is available in two places. This is um, the site at the University of Southampton. Um, Bob Chris hosts a number of other digital projects here, um, but this is the page for the 18th century material. Um, if we move on, here's the advanced search on the Bob Chris home site. Um, so you can <coughs> refine your search a little bit here um, using date ranges and um, document types. But if we move on to the um, commercial page available from ProQuest, you can see that there's an awful lot more um, available here on the left hand side in terms of how you can search, how you can refine your search, what you can check and uncheck. So you're, you can do a much more detailed search here at ProQuest. Here's the document that you'd see if you were um, looking at it in, on the BotQuest site. This is a bill from 1757. And on the right hand side, that's what you can see at ProQuest. So Joe Innes, who's here with us today, has said that one shouldn't underestimate the impact of ease of access. I could probably work through most of the material for my project in a year of leave that I have, and there's no way that I could have done that before. It would have taken years. Okay, lastly, here we have the Medical Journals Backfiles project at the Wellcome Library. Um, this project has digitised the complete backfiles of a number of important and historically significant medical journals, such as the British Medical Journal and the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. The digitised content is freely available on the internet through PubMed Central and augments the content already there. So the project website that you can see here um, is the project page at the Wellcome Library. Now this provides a link through to PubMed Central but isn't the host of the digital material. So historians of medicine can go to PubMed Central here and search the backfiles material by choosing an advanced search and closing down the date range. But if you don't close down the date range, then you search across the entire platform, you, all the journals, all the runs. So clinicians in particular um, will access historical material through, through this basic search that they wouldn't have had access to before. Here's a little excerpt from the British Medical <laughs> Journal about baby drugging, a very common practice in the 19th century to go with our nice cheery themes of Jack the Ripper um, and lunatic asylums. Um, here, um, the medical community has been uh, having their attention drawn to the fact that in, uh, inquests into these cases were often perfunctory and the difference between um, medical um, coroner's experience of how high a dose to give a, a baby um, differs considerably from, from the coroner in this case. So it's, it's a wonderful resource. Tilly Tansy, a professor at the his, of history of mo modern medical sciences at UCL, has said of the digitization of medical journal back files, it allows me to be more comprehensive. I'm a great one for browsing. That's why I love having books on shelves. 
But if I'm looking for a particular paper and it's in the Journal of Physiology, I look through the whole issue and I always see something that's interesting. I've found really interesting things that I haven't necessarily come across in my research in the past. And those are our five projects. So now we're going to spend a bit of time telling you about the methods we've used in our project and talk a bit more in detail about the impacts that we've discovered. is uh, Professor Mike Thelwall, who's from University of Wolverhampton and one of the uh, leading experts on webometrics, which is one of the things he'll be talking about today. Okay. So just a quick overview of some of the quantitative methods that we've used um, in our project and that, we, um, that we've written up for our toolkit for the impact of digitized scholarly resources. We're going to talk in more detail about some of these than others, but please go to the toolkit and find out more about the ones that you want to know more about. There's plenty of information there, and please contribute if you've got something to say about them. So the, the methods primarily that we used in the quantitative side of the research were web metrics, uh, analytics, in this case Google, <coughs> log file analytics, and mm. scientometrics or bibliometrics. Okay, so I'll just say a little bit about what is Webometrics. So it's probably the least well known of all the techniques that we've used in this project. So um, although Webmetrics is a field with lots of different uh, measurements based on gathering and analyzing web data, for this project we were particularly interested in using uh, hyperlinks in web pages pointing to the archives that we were studying. So the idea is that um, if you have an archive that gets a lot of users, then most of those users will just visit the archive and use it and not leave any, any trace elsewhere on the web of what they've done. But a proportion of those users will um, create their own web pages that contain a link to the archive. So, for example, they might create a blog entry saying, oh, I visited this archive, it was great, and have a link to it. Or there might be educators that aren't in lunatic asylums that uh, create... Um, web pages for their students with a, a link to the archive for the students to follow. So you'd imagine in general that a successful archive would have a number of web pages that would link to, the, that would link to it and you could use those web pages first of all as evidence that it, the archive is being used is having an impact and secondly you can visit the web pages and you can see what they're saying about the archive so you get some free contextual information um, uh, from the web, and you can find these web pages quite easily with uh, appropriate search engine queries. And then finally, and perhaps a little bit sinisterly, you can compare the number of links to any archive with the number of links to any other archive. So you can see, compared to similar archives, how is your archive doing? So it's only very, very rough and ready, but um, it is at least a way of having an indicator, an indicator of the overall impact of a particular archive. So how did we use Webmetrics in our toolkit project? Well, the first thing that we had to do was select some comparator sites. That's a really crucial phase um, of the process. So for each of the projects, we tried to pick one resource that was very similar in content, one that was similar in style, and one that differed in terms of its access rights. So if we had a closed project, we compared it with an open access project and vice versa. So, I mean, this, this was um, perhaps a little bit more difficult for us to do because we didn't know the, the projects very well when we started the, re the research. But if you're developing your research, it'll, it'll be your resource, it'll be much easier for you to do it because you know what kind of resources you want to compare to yourself to and you know which other ones are in your, in your field. Um, we had one or two problems uh, when we were running our analysis that I should mention. Um, so the first one was in shifting URLs. Quite a number of our projects shifted their URLs during the course of our research. So we had to try and catch up. And uh, if you're monitoring a link to a website and then that website moves, how do you then compare those results to a project that hasn't moved its, its URL and that you're able to follow through the whole project? Well, it was quite complicated. And we have figured out a way of doing it. And that will all be in the toolkit. Um, so one of the benefits of Webmetrics is it allows you to judge how well linked to your resource is and 
if you if you start changing your URLs, it's much harder for, for you to track that. One of our um, other problems was um, with uh, the Welcome Medical Backfiles project, um, which um, has a uh, has a, a URL that it gives out, which is very simple. Um, it's library.welcome.ac.uk slash backfiles. But when you reach the page, that's not the link that appears um, in the search box at the top. Um, so if you were creating a link, how would you do it? You'd either right click the link that you see advertised and save it, or else you'd go to that page and highlight the link that you see and copy that and create your link that way. So it's very plausible that people will be linking to the same page but with completely different URLs. So we had to take that into account as well. So what did we find? Well, um, with Hispop, um, you can see here, um, again, there's a short URL for Hispop, hispop.org, but when you reach the page, there's a much longer um, URL. So we had to we had to follow both, and those um, hispop.org is the top line, and the, um, the longer version is the second line. So one of the comparative projects that we um, chose for Hispop, and I'm sure Matthew will tell us whether he thinks this is good or not, um, was the Historical Directories project at the University of Leicester. So um, that project is, um, uh, has digitised um, trade directories from the 18th, 19th and 20th century, so it provides um, lots of local information about the kinds of business, businesses that were proliferating in different places um, during that time. So we can see um, Historical Directories was launched several years before HISPOP, and given that, I think HISPOP did fantastically well compared to that project, um, very similar number of links, um, the main's the most reliable um, result when you're looking at web metrics, and those, those figures compare extremely well. So perhaps even more interestingly, um, we tracked um, his work against the National Archives census data page. Um, one of the things we were aware of with his pop is that there are a lot of genealogists finding it and, and thinking that it could tell them something specific about their families, which of course it can't, um, although it can give them fantastic um, information about um, what's going on in, local, in the local area at the time that your relatives were around. Um, but obviously, amateur history genealogy is one of the, one of the most in, um, uh, most uh, it's one of the greatest activities that's going on in the web at the moment. Um, and so, you'd expect there to be a phenomenal number of links to census data at the National Archives. But in fact, this spot is doing fantastically well against this resource. It's, I mean, it's difficult to make statements about whether that means that genealogists aren't linking or um, whether they're all going to they're all making links to his pop as well. It's, you know, um, the analysis is, is, um, is not straightforward here, but as a very basic, at a very basic level, it shows that his pop performs extremely well against um, a, much, a much bigger and um, uh, perhaps well-known resource. Okay, some of our other results. The British Library 19th Century Newspaper um, page, which you saw before, and which doesn't, um, when you're outside the British Library, does not link to the resource itself, um, records a really surprisingly high number of links. Um, so um, one of the things that we did was to track back and look at some of the websites that were linking to that project, and we found um, a lot of blogs in that, um, in that list um, who were all making the information about the fact that that resource um, was out there. Um, available to all the people who connect to those blogs. So there's a rich blog community for 19th century studies that um, were very excited about that project. Um, the British Library Archival Sounds project also um, performed really well. You can see the, the numbers at the top there. Um, one of the things we did was to look at the number of links to the existing, um, the, the resource that sort of gave birth to the digital product. Um, so in this case, the sound archive and one of the interesting things that we found here, um, and this was before the British Library pages were revamped, by the way, um, was that the Sound Archive home, which you can see is extremely well linked to the second band across the top there, um, that, that page, extremely well linked to, had a link to the archival sounds material. But in fact, it was the catalogue that was the most linked to page overall, and that didn't have a link to the archival sounds project. So all the people who were linked to that page, who were going directly to the Sound Archive catalogue, were missing out on finding out about the Archival Sounds project. So that was um, a sort of unexpected result from our web metrics, which could be really useful to you if you were planning where to put the information about your new digital resource, where, which pages on your website are the most linked to. Put that information there. 
Okay, um, the 18th century parliamentary papers um, recorded fewer links than to Bocris itself. Um, but actually, I, I found that um, very interesting and thought perhaps um, showed that they were wise to, to attach themselves to um, a really well-known resource like Bocris, because if you're going to Bocris, you're going to stop there, you're going to have a look around, you're going to see what, what else they've added in their digital collections. So I don't think that's anything to worry about. Um, and it was actually higher than the number of links to its commercial partner at ProQuest, which may be because those resources are often reached through library catalogues, but it's an interesting comparison to make. And lastly, the Welcome Medical Backfiles project, um, which you can see at the bottom here. So the actual project page um, was the short URL of the backfiles, slash backfiles. Um, the given project page um, was, the, was the one that you reached when you actually got to the web page. And one of the difficulties here was that the material was absorbed into PubMed Central, which, as you all know, is, a, is an absolutely massive resource. It's extremely well um, known about in, in the sciences. Um, there, are, there are so many links to it that it was, it was impossible to isolate people who were going there to look at the historical material from people who were going there because they were scientists and they were looking for scientific papers. So here's, a, here's an instance where it was quite difficult to track anything useful about, pub, about the resource at PubMed Central using the web metrics. Okay, so just a little bit about um, Google Analytics and al analytics in general. So the, the web metrics told us about links to uh, web pages uh, for impact assessment and context information. And the analytics and the log files a little bit later on uh, tell us more directly about the visitors to the site. So. Um, I'm sure a few of you are familiar with Google Analytics, so it's a, a free service that Google offers and all you have to do is put a little bit of code in every web page and then Google will automatically create some lovely graphs about where your visitors come from, how many visitors you get each day, how long they stay on the site. So really uh, useful standard kind of information about your site. Um, so, so that's uh, something to have as a good kind of baseline uh, technique for monitoring uh, any website if you don't have any other technique. But there are also, uh, just for information, there are more sophisticated versions. So if you have a big budget, you can buy uh, commercial analytics software, which will tell you much more in detail information. For example, you could find out um, uh, what proportion of users who follow a certain sequence of pages then go and leave the site, or, or, or what proportion who follow that sequence then go on to do another search. Uh, for example, so you can kind of set up pathways through your site and see how effective users are, are following them. So this software is really designed for commercial websites uh, selling a product, um, but it is very good at giving very detailed information about what the users do on your site. But Google Analytics is a good uh, free one. And so we're very excited about using Google Analytics for our project sites for TIDSA. But unfortunately, we weren't able to use it on any of them. Um, there are lots of different reasons for that. Some people were a bit nervous about Google. Others, it just wasn't practical with the um, web architecture that they had. So we can't tell you anything about what Google Analytics can say about these five project sites. Um, but I did think uh, we, we, we do have a paper um, from a library who've used Google Analytics for exactly the kinds of um, things that we wanted to show for our project sites. So if I just take you through some of the findings that, that this paper came up with, it'll give you some idea of what you can do with Google Analytics. So in this case, um, this was the Rutgers Newark Law Library for the Center of Law and Justice. Um, and they used Google Analytics to look at the usage of their website, to um, find out more about their visitor behaviors. How are they clicking through the site? Where are they going? Where, where are they not going? Um, the efficiency of the website's menu system, suggestions for improving user experiences, and really they were looking to redesign the website on the basis of their findings. So, so um, Fang found that using web analytics was highly preferable than relying on open-ended surveys and log files because analytics provided objective and multifaceted statistical data in a visual way for webmasters to better understand interaction between visitors and websites. So when you use Google Analytics, you can actually see the results mapped onto your website. You'll see the front page of your website and you'll see statistics on where people are going and where they're clicking through. So you can follow them through the website and see what proportion of visitors are going where. So with web analytics, you don't need to worry about um, location-based problems inherent in paper-based surveys. 
and uh, or about receiving accurate information because that you are seeing exactly what people are doing. So Fang's paper suggested that Google Analytics highlighted a number of factors that they then took under consideration as a library staff and decided how how they would mod how they would modify the website, what things needed to be got rid of, what things were obviously very popular, and they had fantastic results. Um, using Google Analytics in this way, the library increased new visitors by 21% and returned visitors by almost 50%. So it's it really is an effective way of seeing what your visitors are doing and tailoring your website to to their activities. So the, the web server log file analysis is very similar to the Google Analytics. It's just um, a, a different technology, really. So um, just a little bit about the background. So when you request a page over the web, the, the program that sends you that page, is the web server, um, typically also makes a record that you've visited that page, you've asked for that page. And it keeps a very simple um, log file of every visitor who's requested every page. And it records some basic things, such as the time when the visit's made, uh, the page that was requested, um, the IP number of the user, and any logon information that's been entered by the user. Um, so this plain text file, in theory, contains everything about how the site is used. And uh, if you set up a, a log file analysis program, then that will produce lovely summary statistics. Uh, very similar to the Google Analytics, so how many people use each, uh, visit each page every day, how long people spend on each page, um, how many pages the typical visitor visits, um, where in the world these visitors come from based on the IP addresses. So very similar kind of information. Um, it just takes a little bit more uh, technical setting up to actually get the, the log file analysis running. But um, definitely every um, archive ought to have either the analytics or the log file analysis going so they can track what the visitors are doing. Okay, so we were able to use log file analysis in the TEDSA project, you'd be glad to know. Um, so um, mostly we were able to collect processed web stats. So we were seeing what the projects were looking at, how often they were looking at these statistics and what sort of things they were looking for, what were they counting. Um, so we were able to compare how often um, these statistics were involved in changes in the resources websites and um, uh, the, um, the sort of enhancement of the resource. But um, with this project, we really wanted to get away from that, the sort of the hit rate method of um, measuring impact. So although it was fantastic news to know that our, all our projects were growing in um, hit rates and downloads and um, the, you know, the numbers are steadily on the rise. Um, we wanted to get it a little bit more than that. And we were able to do that with Histpop. Um, so we, we collected raw log files um, that Histpop was generous enough to share with us. Um, and we were able to look at a, a whole range of different things, um, much more the sorts of information that you would get through Google Analytics. So what search terms were, were used to find the resource? Um, who were the top referrer sites? Who was, who was pointing people in direction of Hispop? And how were users using it? What time of day were they, were they there? How long did they stay? Um, how many downloads did they complete while they were there? So lots of interesting information that we found. Um, the, the most popular search um, that people completed before they reached Hispop was fantastically Histpop, which shows that that is a really well-chosen um, name, and it's obviously penetrated the research community really well. Um, I mean, you can see the massive difference between that search and the next one down, which also wonderfully was Hispop.org. Great, people know about this resource, they know where to find it. So the top referrer sites, which I'm afraid I don't have a slide for you um, to, to see, um, allowed us to see really important information about where visitors were coming from. So we were able to map the geography of visitors reaching Hispop. And actually, there were a, a really significant proportion of visitors from the United States, um, which is wonderful. Um, and access um, statistics allowed us to, to look at what time of the day this resource was really popular. And of course, there, there are lots of keen people accessing around nine o'clock, but there's a real surge around lunchtime when the, the research guilt sets in and you realize you really ought to be doing some work. And so the, the numbers go up, but then they stay up for the rest of the day. The numbers are, are, are really high for the rest of the day. So that's a really interesting observation about, you know, what are people, when, when are people doing their research? When are they finding um, time to go online? And actually they're online an awful lot and throughout the day one of the great things about digital resources is that you can do your research at any time 
Okay, we're going to invite um, Eric Meyer up to talk to you a little bit about scientometrics and bibliometrics now. So, one, before I start on this, one comment about the previous, um, the analytics and the log file analysis. One of the things that we want to uh, re reiterate, and it's in the toolkit as well, is not to get bogged down in these sorts of things, in these, these number-based uh, reports, because th this is a mistake some people often make when they first start doing these, is they'll, they'll print them out every single month and bring them to every single meeting, and people get burned out on looking at the numbers that don't change very often. Um, for a lot of these things, you can do them you know, quarterly, every six months, uh, possibly after your uh, resource is established and well operating, you know, maybe on an annual, annual basis, to see how things have changed from year, year to year. One of the things you can do with the, uh, the analytics and the log files both is you know, set ranges of dates you're looking for. So you can look for an entire six month period rather than just the previous month or so. So uh, we, we have seen places get bogged down in you know, seeing so many of these reports over and over and over again that they stop being meaningful. If you look at them, if you put them on your schedule, look at them regularly, however, they can stay meaningful by looking at them on a more uh, spaced out basis. So scientometrics and bibliometrics, this is uh, related to webmetrics and it's actually the field that webmetrics grew out of Scientometrics and bibliometrics go back decades and decades and decades uh, to uh, someone named Eugene Garfield who started Thompson ISI, which many of you are familiar with, the Web of Science, Web of Knowledge resource that's on the, on the internet. Um, and bibliometrics, any of us who are involved with uh, you know, the, the potential changes to the, the upcoming assessment in a few years, the REF, that they're going to be measuring people based on their citation counts and so forth. That's scientometrics and bibliometrics, looking at citations to your work. Now, one of the tricks with uh, trying to do scientometrics or bibliometrics on collections like this is people's citation habits regarding electronic resources are incredibly variable. Um, we found time and time again in the interviews that we'll mention in a few minutes that People's habits, particularly in the hist history fields of citing a digital resource, is to cite the paper resource and never mention that they've used the digital resource at all. So if you then try and find evidence in citations of uses of that resource, the electronic uses completely disappear in the evidence because all you can find is paper um, citations. And you don't really know, did they actually go cite the paper? And or did they not? You can possibly see if there's big upticks in people citing the paper resources um, after you've put the digital ones online. You have some suspicion that you might be um, influencing those citations. But um, you can't tell for sure unless they've included possibly a URL. Um, one of the things that we are encouraging sites to do is to uh, have a suggested bibliographic citation form for your materials, either on your home page or on a help page or even possibly if you can embed it uh, with your database onto individual items on the web. You know, if you use this, here's a copy and paste uh, citation you can use to cite this resource. Um, we think that's very good practice. And you can either do that by including the U a URL to your, res your site in that suggested bibliographic citation. But you can, if, if you suspect that your users are going to delete that out because there is an underlying suspicion still, particularly among historians, of digital things and things on the web. We found that time and time again in interviews that they like, even students would say, well, I don't put those on because I don't think my teachers will think that I did real research if I include a URL in there somehow. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a changing attitude, but it is still very much there. Um, you can also include uh, things such as document IDs that have a very clear format that are searchable that are unique to your resource. So if you include, you know, this and a document ID in brackets that to you identifies that it came from your digital collection, then when you look in things like Thompson ISI, you're going to be able to search for any references that include that, that unique identifying part of a string that has you know, digital document numbers after it and have a much better chance of finding your resource in citations. Um, now, the three most common uh, tools to be, that people use for science metrics and bibliometrics are um, Google Scholar, Scopus, and the ISI Web of Knowledge, Web of Science. The Web of Science is the oldest one of these. It's, it's been used for a long time for these sorts of things. Scopus was developed in 2004. Um, Google Scholar, many, most of us are familiar with, um, has been developed in the last few years. Now, Google Scholar is probably the most accessible of these, but it's the most difficult to use in terms of large-scale bibliometric analysis if you have lots of citations because you can't download the data as easily as you can from Scopus or Thompson ISI. Um, 
Now, for these particular projects, we're talking about a very limited time scale. And as any of us in academia know, <laughs> citations don't appear immediately. They have to percolate their way through the publication process. You know, people will use a resource, they'll write a paper, it'll be submitted to journals, it'll eventually find its way into publication. So the numbers for um, articles citing these resources are quite low at this point. But that sh what, what we want to um, get people thinking about is the fact that at the beginning, you need to think about these issues if you want to be able to track citations later on down the road. So even though you know, now a year or two into these things, there's relatively no, low numbers, if you've made it difficult to be able to track citations of your resource because you don't have any suggested citation styles and people aren't citing the digital versions in any, in any fashion, um, you'll still not be able to track them 10 years down the road when you may have collected lots of citations. Um, so this is something that we would like to reiterate the, to the projects. So so that's just a brief bit about science metrics. Um, now let's switch directly on to qualitative materials. Um, the toolkit that we developed used both the quantitative measures, measures that you've been hearing about and also more qualitative um, measures, and then also a survey that we'll talk about in a minute. Now these, these qualitative methods are things that most of you are probably familiar with, interviews, focus groups, um, user feedback, and something we're calling referrer analysis. And these approaches are meant to understand in greater detail um, understand in greater detail some of the things that you might want to know about how the people involved in developing the resource thought the impact was going to be, how people are using the resource, talking to users, talking to um, in the focus groups, talk either users or non-users who then you can have go visit the resource and talk about them. Um, so we did a number of interviews. Primarily, Catherine did a lot of interviews. Um, I went along on some of them. And these were with a wide variety of people, key project personnel, uh, institutional personnel who were related to the projects but um, weren't necessarily included in the project, such as uh, subject librarians and things like that, um, end user communities. A number of the projects were able to give us names of end users or ways of finding end users of their projects so we could talk, talk to them about how did you use the resource, what are you using it for. Um, what sort of impact is it having on your research and on your teaching and on your other scholarly ha um, habits? Um, subject specialists who might, may or may not be familiar with the resource about general trends um, for resources of that nature. Um, some of the other stakeholders. Now, one of the things that um, a lot of people forget when they do interview, stakeholder interviews of this sort, and I'm always harping away at students to do, is to try and find when, when, when something goes from paper to digital, a lot of changes in the world. I've done a lot of research on this. You know, people's work practices change, the way they interact with people change, um, but also people who were formerly involved in the production of knowledge and the production of accessing knowledge can sometimes be excluded from the new process, the digital processes. And it's important to try and find some of those people who may have been excluded. So if certain types of librarians that were responsible for the paper collections are no longer involved in the digital collections, it can, ha it can be helpful to talk to them about who their users, who they thought their users were, and, whether, and then you can try and follow up on whether the users that are using these digital resources are being served um, by these same resources or if some have been left behind. And you can also talk to them if you can find them. Also, obviously, funding personnel, uh, people at places like JISC in this case. Also, um, you know, it was quite interesting. We did some interviews over at ProQuest, who was involved with the BopCris, the commercial partners of BopCris, and found out some very interesting uh, things of different uh, pers percep perceptions on the resources from the commercial side versus the academic side, um, and some of the different uh, choices that were made in migrating these two parallel collections onto the Bob Chris site and onto the ProQuest site. Um, do you want to talk briefly about some of the uh, actual interview data? Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, so um, some of the interesting things that we found out about impact um, through interviews. Um, uh, when we were talking to users of HISPOB, um, we reached a number of educators who'd been using the resource um, to, to get their undergraduates familiar with primary sources, which was something that they'd found um, much easier to do with digitized primary sources. Um, so um, David Green, who I mentioned earlier, who's a lecturer in geography at King's College London, reported that he'd used HISPOB in a second and then a third year undergraduate module, the third year um, module, grew out of this, the popularity of the second year module. Um, and uh, that his students really enjoyed the freedom to explore these primary sources at such an early stage of their undergraduate careers. 
and that this had um, spiralled on and that he'd had a series of final year dissertations of very high quality, which he said were enhanced, really enhanced by this early access to primary sources. By the time they reached the final year dissertation stage, they really knew what they were doing because they'd been using HISPOF and understanding what using those resources is all about. So he said, I think the students scored so well because they'd already been introduced to these resources and were used to dealing with historical documents. So using HISPOF as a teaching tool fed into a really high standard of, of, of these particular dissertations. He said HISPOF made it possible to do a completely different kind of project at undergraduate level. It, it allowed them to start using primary sources to do basic research, which they definitely wouldn't have been able to do before. And so he said that using the resources in this way really allowed him to separate the, the really good students from the, the middle of the road and the weaker students. Those who really took to the primary sources um, that they were using at HISPOP were, were clearly separated from the pack, which is a really useful thing to know about when you're teaching. Um, he also stated that one of the great things about these digitized resources, and those of you who are educators in the room, um, one of the things that I think sends us to the lunatic asylum at the moment is plagiarism. It's a really big problem. It's a really difficult thing to handle, and there, you know, it's a, it's something that you have to grapple with at all times of your career when you're teaching. Um, so the great thing about using these primary sources as as coursework projects was that there was no way the students could plagiarize. So this is a great project, a uh, great undergraduate module that rules out some of those plagiarism issues, but also promotes really high quality research at an early stage of a student's career. Um, a second uh, impact that we discovered through the interview process was um, d um, issues surrounding the type of research projects being presented at conferences. Um, so we spoke to um, Dr. Peter Mandler, who's a, a fellow and tutor at uh, Gonville and Keyes College in Cambridge. Um, he's um, uh, hosting a conference this summer, which is the first meeting of the British and American um, Victorian Studies Associations. And he had been leafing through about 500 paper proposals and had really noticed um, that a lot more of those uh, paper proposals than had previously been doing so were working on sources that, uh, on digitized resources that were coming from databases. And in particular, he'd noticed um, quite a number of newspaper projects. Um, and he, he really found that there was a lot more quantitative research being done using this, um, using this kind of resource. So the kinds of research models that people are getting used to now are, are growing out of the kinds of the possibilities that are, are for research that these digital, digital resources provide. Um, and he said, you do feel the ground shifting. Um, the place where you see it most is where people make these generalizations and they, they are using these global searches and therefore they're, and they're, they're increasingly citing their methods, their search behaviors in their, in their academic proposals. And the third um, impact that we discovered um, through interviews um, this is um, related to the Archival Sounds project. Um, we spoke to Celia Duffy, who I mentioned earlier, who was on the steering committee for the resource and is a great champion of it. Um, and she, um, she suggested that one of the nicest things about using these digitized resources is the, in the increased and slightly different but serendipitous nature of the research that you do when you're using them. Um, and she said that what she'd found most enjoyable was the um, the serendipitous nature of the resource. I didn't have a clue about some of these African music recordings, she said, and I found some really wonderful stuff. A, a whole series of radio programs I didn't know existed, a whole genre of music, that, um, jazz in this case from Soweto, that she didn't know had existed. And it was a great moment in her research. It, it took her into a completely different area. And she said, dipping in and out of these things, that's just impossible when you're using the sound archive. When you use the sound archive, you need to know exactly what you're looking for so that somebody can go and get it for you. But when you're discovering things on the web, you can just dip in and out, find out what's there, perhaps experience a whole different kind of music and take your research in a whole new direction. Okay, um, focus groups are another uh, nice way of finding out how your resource is being used and understood. Uh, focus groups are sort of like group interviews. You get a group of people together um, and talk about a small number of themes during the course of a focus group. Now, you shouldn't uh, make these too big. This is a mistake I've seen at some focus groups I've been invited to where they get too big. You know, they get 20 or 25 people involved, which you can't really do much with that many people in a focus group. Um, we try and keep focus groups, you know, under 10 people, a dozen at the max. Um, because what you're doing during a focus group is, in an interview, you know, you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, 
and you're not getting opportunities for them to have other ideas come in. During a focus group, you get multiple people talking not only to you but to each other and starting to feedback ideas to each other about this, the ways they're using digital resources. Um, <clears throat> we've done a few of these focus groups, uh, particularly um, some interesting ones with students um, about who, who in this case weren't familiar with the resources we had them look at but we gave them computer, we had some laptops that we had set up. We started by talking to them about some general themes, how they found digital resources, how they found new things they would use for their research um, and then took them to a couple of sites and said okay first how would you find if you were looking for uh, you know 19th century British newspapers, where, how, would, how would you find these things and watched and recorded what they were doing to find these resources. Um, interestingly, you know, not unsurprisingly we would think they would just hop on Google, but um, what was the name of the resource that many of them go straight to? Uh, anyway, <laughs> it'll be in the toolkit. Um, th th there, there's other tools that at particular colleges, particularly where their libraries have set up good portals to, to digital information, they'll go straight to that rather than through Google because they know they can find things through this library portal that's been set up for them. Um, so that can tell you a lot about how users might be finding the resource if you say, find a resource that is about this topic and then seeing where they go and seeing if yours comes up in the top list of search efforts that they have. Once they get there then, we watched how they used it, um, how they were, it, it's very instructive if you put them in groups on computers, you know, two or th maximum three on a computer and hear how they're talking to each other as they do this because, you know, one will be running the keyboard and the other will say, no, 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 click there, click here. What, you can tell a lot about how they're navigating around the site because they're talking to each other about it as you're sort of hovering behind them listening to how they're navigating around the site. These are very handy techniques for seeing how people use your site. If, if you know, many of, many bigger projects have staff to do this stuff that's often called human computer interaction where they put people in front of computers. But having them do it in groups is very instructive because when they're doing it individually on a computer, the stuff stays in their brain and they're just clicking. If you get two people doing it, they start talking to each other about what they're doing and you can then listen in on how they're navigating around these things. Um, so you, you, you can find out a lot about um, usability and findability of your resource. You can also find out a lot of interesting general things. As the course of a, a focus group goes on, you know, they often will last an hour, an hour and a half. You shouldn't keep people there forever. They'll get tired out. Um, toward the end, as people get more comfortable with what you're doing and with each other, you'll get all sorts of interesting serendipitous things that they'll be saying about using digital resources in general. Um, we had this fascinating discussion about uh, how, you know, at the very end as they were packing up their things about how Facebook has completely replaced email for some of these students. Um, quite interesting stuff that they, they only talk to old people like us with email. They don't talk to each other with Facebook. <laughs> Um, but that could even be useful if your site is trying to get to students, if you maybe put a Facebook group up, if that's the way you're trying to find people, uh, possibly. Um, now, user feedback is something that most sites do. They, they have a way for people to email the site. Um, one of the things, though, that we encourage that uh, we saw relatively few instances of is um, periodically going back and reviewing this in a systematic way. That you don't just you know, sort of get an email, answer it, and store it away, get an email, answer it, that, you know, maybe on a six month or annual basis, go back and look at those and try and find, uh, you know, as you get got them, you should be classifying them as the kind of response you're getting, whether it's positive, negative, neutral, or whether it's comments on new features and things like that. You know, go back and review that and see if, well, I'm getting lots of comments on this sort of feature that we don't have implemented, maybe we should do that. So you should be systematic about going back and reviewing this sort of user feedback that you get because you probably get um, user feedback because you've got these resources up there and you've provided an easy link for people to do these things. Also, if you've provided the ability for people to comment on items, you should you know, make an effort to go back and look at those comments periodically to find out what people are saying rather than just sort of forgetting that the comments even exist and letting them uh, build up on pages. So this user feedback is something that we had limited access to in our case as far as getting the user feedback that people had emailed to, to sites because they, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, but for the user feedback we were able to do, um, the next slide have about that, yeah. Um, that we, we were able to then, uh, for instance from HisPop, you'll hear about a lot of HisPop, they're very cooperative. <laughs> um, so we were allowed to send an email that forwarded to some users who had contacted HisPop and then uh, we did some email interviewing with these, not talking to them in person, but sending them some questions by email to understand uh, how they used it, why they had contacted HisPop, what, whether they were still using it, what, you know, what, what that exchange had meant. Um, and this is something that uh, it's very difficult to do. This is tied up with the whole sustainability issue that everybody's worried about, right? 
the funding model for most projects is they get funded and the, the funding ends and then how do you continue the project beyond there? You don't have uh, staff time and resources to have somebody continually answering email necessarily. Um, the, uh, uh, the description I heard of the other day, where, where, where were we? Um, somebody described it as the, the, um, the Bernie Madoff model of, of financing digitization projects that uh, essentially were uh, having future projects support the sustainability of previous projects by having staff keep staying around for, by future funding. This is how Bernie Madoff made his money, right? He had the future investors pay off the past investors by keeping them happy. Um, and to a certain extent, we rely on that, right? We rely on continuing funding for other projects to keep staff around who will keep the previous projects going along if we don't have sustainability. And this is something I know that, that funders such as JISC are well aware of, the sustainability issue. But it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge if you want to keep these sites living and, and breathing over time and not just become abandoned. Um, you'll see uh, this afternoon when we talk about, about our work with the Internet Archive, partly what the Internet Archive is doing is archiving these sites away so that when they do get abandoned, they do still exist someplace. Um, even if they've been shut off. Um, now, refer analysis is similar to Webmetrics, but it's more focused. And this is trying to look at um, particularly educational and library resources that are referring to um, websites. One of the things we've heard time and time again from people who teach is that one of the ways that students find resources is through reading lists. And so we did a, a, a bit of work um, trying to find reading lists and you know, library links to these resources. So how are students finding these, these these digital collections. Um, now, one of the challenges of trying to find reading lists is so many of them are locked away behind, uh, you know, Moodle and, and other courseware pages. But sometimes you can find the link that came from a, a, a Moodle site in the link analysis, but you can't actually access the site because it's behind the password. But if you know that it was there, it came from a courseware site, you have some suspicion at least that it was courseware that was linking to your site, which will tell you about how much your resource is being used in the educational community. And if that's a group of stakeholders that you've identified as important, um, you should try and enhance that wherever possible. So we're running out of time, so I want to go straight into the survey that we've done, um, which will be the last thing we present before we take some questions and then take a break. Now this is a survey that we all did. Uh, Christine Madsen here in the front was also was particularly responsible for helping us field this. Um, and I'll just briefly go through this. This is a survey that you know, surveying your users is something that's important, and there's different ways of doing this. You can have little requests on your web page. You can have little pop-ups that people get annoyed by. Um, you can send out, if you've got lists of users, if people have to register on your site, you can send them an email survey. And on, on the toolkit, we've got a number of suggested survey uh, tools that are available to you. We did a survey that we're trying to understand all five of these studies, and so it was not sent as a targeted survey, but it was sent out to a number of email lists that historians and people in the humanities read. Um, we got about 714 respond to the link. And whenever you do a survey, a certain people, number of people will get to the first page and say, oh, this isn't for me to leave. So we had 550, about 77% of those people who arrived complete the survey. Um, and it took people about 17 and a half minutes to fill it out. This is, it's important when you do a survey to tell people on the front page about how long they can expect to do it so you don't get a lot of dropout in the course of the survey. And luckily, we told people it would take about 20 minutes to complete the survey, and it was about right. 83% completed it in under 20 minutes. Um, also, we had a question near the end of the survey that had people have an option of either finishing at that point because we've gotten the main part of the data they wanted, or to continue on to some additional questions about collaboration, which would uh, tied to a survey that Bill Dutton and I had done previously with social scientists about how they collaborate because we wanted to get comparable data for humanities people. And 80% of the respondents agreed to go on to those further questions, which means that our survey didn't fatigue them too badly because they'd gotten to that point and were ag agreed to answer a few more questions without stopping. So a little bit about the demographics. Um, we had a little bit more non-UK than UK respondents, but a pretty good uh, sample of UK respondents within that, uh, quite evenly split between males and females. I think there was a difference of two between the men and women. There were two more men than women. Um, the age group, this is something that we often see in online surveys. Uh, slightly higher preponderance of younger people agreeing to respond to them than older. It's not terribly surprising. And this decade that highest degree earned in the most recent years. Now this is, Something, again, that showed up in the survey that Bill Dutton and I did about social scientists is we found in that survey, and we're still analyzing the data from this to see if it compares, that one of the predictors of whether people were likely to use digital tools and such was less their age. Age wasn't actually a terribly good predictor, but the recency with which they've earned their highest degree was a good predictor. 
of whether they were likely to use digital resources because they've been educated in a time when those were the resources used. So someone who is, uh, you know, slightly younger but earned a, you know, you, you've got, these things are tied up together, you know, but people who earn a degree at an older age are more likely to use a digital resource than people of their same age who earned a degree um, much more, much longer before. Average age is about 45 in this sample. Um, about half of the sample had earned doctor, doctoral degrees, uh, another third master's degrees. Most, um, well, not quite most, almost most came from history. Uh, the, these data are all on the website, and I'll show you where those are in a minute. Um, and then a few other areas, languages, literature, classics, art history, so forth. Uh, most of them called themselves academics, a few, some students, some non-academic researchers, librarians, and so forth. Um, when asked what their primary activities were, most were involved heavily in research, more lightly in service teaching, and less so in administration. So we basically got academic researchers that are the ones responding to this by and large. Now this is trying to get awareness of these different sites. So we've got our five sites embedded among this long list of other things. And we, the reason we did this is we could have just asked, are you aware of these sites, one, two, three, four, five, but then we wouldn't have known how, our, how these compared to some of these comparator projects we used in other parts of this toolkit, but also whether people were just picking these five, you know, saying, yes, I'm aware of this because they only have five choices. So we gave them 15 choices, I believe, or 12, something like that, and had this, this longer list and said, you know, are you aware of this resource? Do you use this resource regularly? Have you um, visited it but don't use it? And then we could, this table's broken down by UK and non-UK, so you can see that the most aware is the House of Commons Parliamentary Papers, which was not one of our projects that we were looking at, but the British Library Newspapers, which is the second, was um, very high awareness, particularly within the UK, 77%. Now, HISPOP has the least level of awareness, but you've seen that there's actually quite good, um, they did quite well in terms of the web metrics earlier. So um, that's one of the reasons why you have to use these multiple measures, because if you just look at one, you don't get the complete picture. So of overall awareness, there's relatively low of HISPOP, but the people who do use it have linked to it quite heavily. Um, telling us that possibly the people who use it are finding it very, very useful and helpful, even though it's targeted at a relatively small proportion of the history uh, population in the UK or elsewhere. Um, so th this is one of the, this I think underscores the danger of simply relying on uh, very simple analytics for understanding if you're having an impact. Because if you just look at how many people viewed your page or how does your page fare in comparison to other pages on the web, um, you're not going to get a very complete picture unless you start to build up all these different measures to understand, well, in this measure we're doing quite well, in this measure we're doing less well, but maybe these can help explain each other to a certain extent. Um, so this is for the five projects, how many people use things regularly and whether they've heard of it. So this is the expanded set of questions from the previous slide. Um, so you can see the British Library News, again, does quite well. And the number of people who use any of these resources regularly or frequently is relatively small of, from the sample that we have. Um, many others use it on occasion or have seen it or heard of it, but they don't use it. For the people who know about it but haven't used it, the primary reason is because it's not in their topic area. Most people say, well, I don't use it, but the reason I don't use it is because it's not really my topic area, but if it was, maybe I would use it. Um, we asked people, now there was a, one of the things that is a very important to do, I think, in a survey is to have branching logic. If you've filled out surveys on the web, you can, if, if they've sort of done a very basic HTML one where they say, if you said no to this, manually skip ahead, that's bad. Um, we use software that if they have answered something, it will only show them the questions that are relevant further on in the survey. And you can get this stuff either free or cheap. Um, even something like SurveyMonkey will support branching logic, and you should, you should do that. So on that first screen where we had all the 15 they selected from, if they said they used it, we would then ask further questions, or they were aware of it and used it, um, we would ask further questions of them about that resource. So um, for all the projects, people found them easy to find, easy to use. Three quarters of the people who used it were familiar with it, found them easy to find, easy to use. Uh, comprehensiveness uh, was uh, um, varied, but it's also because some of the sites are not comprehensive and are not, not meant to be comprehensive. You know, the sounds in the new, the sounds archive in particular, they don't pretend that it's all the sounds they have, and everyone knows it's not all the sounds they have, so it's not meant to be comprehensive. But that's a good check of whether people are actually familiar with your site, if you're familiar with your resource. Um, asking whether it's important to their research, uh, about half in many of the cases said it was, whether it's important to their teachings, slightly less, but also remember we had fewer people doing lots of teaching in the sample. 
Um, now, important to the field and would recommend was very high for all these resources, that people thought it was important to their field even if they weren't using it heavily themselves. Um, and they would definitely recommend most of these resources to students and to others because they, were fine, they thought that they were um, valuable digital resources. Um, now, this was, I mentioned earlier about citation patterns. Uh, we asked people whether they'd published a piece based on their work and their work with this collection, and a certain number did. Um, and the actual numbers for that are available on the website. Um, and if so, how did you cite the collection? So you can see um, HISTPOP, most people cited the original and the URL, partly because um, I think it's got such an easy short URL. For others, people were mainly citing the original versions. Um, very few were citing only the online versions, which is the, the lighter column on the right. Um, this was a negative question, you know, whether people thought they were often unavailable or incomplete, just to see if people were having trouble with the websites. By and large, not. Um, people were not having, saying it wasn't working most of the time or was incomplete. Uh, HISPOP had the highest number of often not available, but the website does go down every now and then, um, which I'm th they, they will admit. <laughs> it was down yesterday when I tried to access it. But it came back up. <laughs> okay. That, that was the, one, the four minutes I was after it, I guess. Um, we asked people how they found the resource. Uh, unsurprisingly, a lot through Google, many through professional societies, discussion lists, or conferences, some through their libraries and colleagues, very few through others or for their students, and nobody from their campus IT department. Um, <laughs> and those are the actual numbers for those. And all these slides will be going up on, on, on our website, so you can download these later if you'd like to look at the details of these um, answers. Now, this asked, uh, how you use this resource. Um, most use it as an online re reference source. Some used it for personal interest. Some downloaded it to use offline. Some used it for teaching. Um, then you can see it. Very few people are using it to re remix, reuse, or, re or edit into new new sort, you know, new re new uses. Um, and then a few others. Relatively few for computational analysis as well. And those are the data for that previous slide. Now, this was asking how people generally use digitized resources, not these five particular resources, but resources in general. Again, it's a very similar pattern as how they use those five resources, uh, mostly as an online reference source. So they'll be able to access the stuff, refer to it online, and use it for their research. Um, some will download it to use offline. Some will find materials to consult in person. Now, this downloading to use offline, a lot of people seem to want to do this, and they do do this as a regular part of their behavior, sometimes or often. Um, this is something to keep in mind when you're designing your resource, whether you allow people to do this. You know, some sources will let people download the materials to use offline, some won't. Um, some will only let you use it in particular facilities. And then finally, uh, a couple slides on how people access media. Uh, most people are finding things both in print and online. Uh, when we ask the most frequently used technologies, unsurprisingly everybody uses email. Um, but also a lot of people still use, uh, you know, they use online databases. Um, library catalogs quite heavily in the sample, probably more so than in some other fields. 96% um, use library ca catalogs quite frequently. Um, relatively few use things like digital audio or data archives on the far, far end. Now, this doesn't mean that you know, the people who are digitizing sound archives or sounds are a bad thing. It just means that you can't expect huge numbers of people to be coming to your, your resource when not that many people really use digital audio in their, in their work. Um, now, this is quite detailed, and we, you probably can't see all of this. This is basically asking some attitudes toward digitization in general. Um, the top bar there is asking whether digitization is adequately funded, and most people disagree with that statement. They don't think it's adequately funded. They think more efforts need to be put into digitization. Note that, Alistair. <laughs> um, they do find that digital collections are fairly easy to use. They either agree or are neutral about that. Um, they do think quite heavily that new questions will require the use of digitized resources. People do their research. 76% agree with that. Um, they do think that more training is also needed. They do think that they're already useful. 94% say digitized collections are already useful and that they enhance their personal productivity. 90% um, agreed with that. Fewer say that it enhances their team, but that's also because fewer people actually work in teams in, in history than in some other areas. Um, data that we have, but we didn't present here today. Um, most people are enthusiastic about it. They are generally interested in using computers in, and online resources in their research and teaching and in their personal life. And the negative questions on the bottom were just to, uh, as a check against the previous ones, digitization undermines the quality of humanities research. 87% disagreed with that, that statement. Um, 
they were about split on whether they raise new ethical issues, and most people disagree with the statement that it's more hype than reality, so they do, do think that digitization is delivering on some of the promises that it's making. Um, and we're running out of time, so let me just skip over these collaboration slides. So I think that's the main elements of the toolkit. Let me just briefly show you the actual toolkit. So it's at microsites.oii.ox.uk slash tidzer, and this is available on the web. And this is, as I said, meant to be a growing resource. So you can request an account somewhere down here, request to create a new account that will let you comment on articles we have. Um, also, you can submit new articles for consideration for publication. And we've got the different areas that we talked about in here today. So say uh, uh, Webometrics. Um, we've got a number of articles under each. What is Webometrics? How do I run a web Webometric link analysis using Site Explorer, using Lexi URL Searcher, which are some of the tools we used. And if you click on these articles to read more, you get some background about Webometrics. Um, for many of the resources, we also have uh, already um, uh, some software tools listed, some short bibliographies if you want to do some additional reading on the topics in, in question. So we encourage you to go spend some time looking around this. Either make comments on articles or email us your comments or contribute articles of your own if you've got areas that you don't think we've covered that you think are important for understanding. Um, essentially, all the things we've been talking about today are up here in, in a variety of articles that talk about what it is, how do you use it, what are some of the software tools you could do, what are some other readings you could follow up um, if you want to do more of these things. And for some of them, we already have the portions of our final report that's going to just the detail the results for these five projects. Um, we'll be putting all those up over the next few weeks as we get those um, uh, finished up. This is actually, um, today's the release of the toolkit, um, but it's also a bit of a data collection day for us. In the, the panel that's coming up next, we want, we're hoping to hear more about how people are using these digitized resources and the kind of impact it's having before we write our final report, which is due in a couple of weeks to JISC.